Hello, and welcome to the Artist Studio. I'm Greg Guevara, and I have Spencer Strickland to my side. Today on the show, we have Logan Hotchkiss, who's going to be talking to us about art and mental illness as well. Logan's in the business management and entrepreneurship program at Algonquin. Yeah. He plays bass, and he's an artist. Oh, yeah. Ladies, he's taken. Sorry. <laughs> so, Logan. Yeah. What got you into art? Like, what made you want to paint? So, I've been drawing since I was like a baby, basically. Uh, I never really focused in class, so I was just doodling. Uh, I remember I went through all of my like school like books and stuff, and where there should be answers, there's just doodles around like the sides of the page and on the lines and stuff. So, I've been drawing for a really long time. And then I started painting just because I was having some uh, mental health problems, and there was only one thing to do, I guess. So ever since then, I haven't really stopped, and I don't really plan on stopping for a while. Mm. When did those uh, when did those problems start? I was kind of just working a lot. I was working a night shift, and I wasn't really taking care of myself health wise. I was barely even eating, honestly, like day to day. I hadn't been diagnosed yet, so then once I got diagnosed, I was just kind of like getting your head like lifted out of water. I was like, damn, okay, that's what that is. So I started taking myself a lot more seriously then, and I realized that a good way to put out that energy in a good way was to start painting. How would you define this style? Like dreamy, big strokes, how would you describe it? When I first started painting, I was using only black because I figured that uh, I'd start with color later. So I called it like a like a nightmare, like surrealism almost, like a really like saddened version of what people would normally think is super dreamy. And then once I started getting into actual colors, I really wanted to have like a really light approach to it, but I'm actually trying to you know, say some pretty dark stuff with it. What are you trying to say? It's a day-to-day -day thing. I don't plan my paintings. I've never really sat there and went, I'm really going to paint this thing unless I did a commission. I started just painting because I wanted to just put whatever I wanted on the page. And then once I knew it was done, I stopped. And that's why it looks the way it looks is because I don't plan it. And so I'm not really trying to say anything. But then once I'm done, I can kind of introspect and look back at what I was feeling. And I go, okay, cool. Like, this is what I was feeling like at that time, and this reflects it really well, so I can almost like journal it. So you don't go into the art wanting to say something. No. Do you get a specific meaning from your art afterwards? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can generally sit there and go, okay, well, around this time I was feeling like this, and I was going through this problem. I mean, this one here, there's like kind of, uh, there's like people like up in the clouds, but they look kind of shadowy. Uh, this could be a road or a river. I think of it as a river, and then there's two people. Uh, I started having um, a better relationship with a really important person in my life, and I'm really happy to finally be able to talk to that person on the level that we uh, talk on now. I never really had that beforehand, so this is kind of just like a journey experience where they're kind of looking back at like the memories and going, yo, hype, like we did it. We're, told, we're still here. By the way, for listeners, we'll post links to the Facebook and Instagram for his art so you guys can check this out later. They're beautiful paintings. I'd almost call your art like a train of thought. Exactly. It's just today I am painting and that is what I'm going to do for the next like five hours. I'll like dart off like a couple paintings and then I feel good about them later and then I'll look at them the next day. I recently stopped posting the newer paintings on Instagram because I've started selling my art. And uh, since it's so personal and it's such a look into my own life and look into my own feelings, uh, I really want to meet the people who buy the art. So anytime someone really buys my art, I really want to meet with them in person. I want to have dinner with them or lunch and uh, really get to know what they like about the art as well. I did one commission. This girl named Kira wanted a painting of this picture that she took in Boston. And I can't say it sucked to make, but it sucked to make in the sense that like, I didn't really get what I wanted out of the painting. Like I can't look at the painting and say that I'm satisfied with it, but I can say that she's happy with it. <laughs> like I dislike doing commissions so much that when I actually did it for her and I, we met in person and uh, I was about to exchange it for her, we were buying a frame together. And then I'm like, you know what? I kind of want to add more stuff. Like, can I just add some more stuff to it? And she's He's like, yeah, sure. I don't hate commission, but I, I don't want to do it after this. That's understandable. You should want to be happy with your end product. You shouldn't be like hoping that everyone's going to love my art. I want everyone to love me. I want everyone to buy my art. It should be, what am I going to be happy with at the end of the day? On the other hand, you got to eat. <laughs> That's fair, but if you're proud of your work, people notice that. They tend to flock to the artist mm -hmm. who is genuine. For me, it's a bit of a push and pull. I remember I once did a spoken word poem that I had written for a contest. It was about consent. I would never have written a poem about consent, 
But after doing that, I got more people viewing my regular work. So if I can do something that's a little outside of what I would normally do and a little unsatisfying for me, I suppose, I view it as sort of a short-term loss for a long-term game. Mm -hmm. And that gain is getting more people interested in my work. So, but yeah, no, I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Some, some of the poems I write, if they're for somebody else, it doesn't fulfill me on the same level. Exactly. In a way, I could almost say that like the way that I go about art is a little selfish because I'm just going like, look, these are my feelings and I freaking, I'm going to only put out my feelings in my like situation. And if you want it enough because you like it, then you're going to buy it for that reason. You're not going to buy it because uh, you wanted me to paint something for you. It's going to be that you like my style. Like we can relate on the fact that we both like the painting for the same reasons. There's also that general idea that art is subjective too. Yeah. There's things that you can't expect that everyone's going to want to buy your paintings or listen to Greg's poetry. Or Even in comedy, you get a lot of comedians who make jokes that don't appeal to everybody. Yeah. Oh, of course. And and those jokes are sometimes the best because yeah. you know that you like them and you also know that not everybody else likes them. Yeah. So it's like they're speaking more directly to you. Ultimately, yeah, I'd much rather create a piece of art that 50% of people hate and 50% of people love than a piece of art that 100% of people feel neutral towards. And the reason I want to do that, I think, comes from the fact that every piece of art I've made that's been successful has been because it's been unique in some way or polarizing in some way. Yeah. That's just what's worked for me. So that's kind of the philosophy that I've developed as an artist. Yeah. So since you're an artist as well, uh, you've probably heard of the famous quote of good artists copy, great artists steal. Yeah. Oh, I don't mean to brag, but I was recently sued for plagiarism. So I know I'm a great artist. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's a fear of mine. If I'm as original as I think I am and that like you know, my stuff is unique in its way. I'm always worried that someone could just come along and just go, oh, hype, like I'm gonna literally do what he's doing like right now. And it seems super easy to do, right? Like I started pretty plainly and I just grabbed like five colors and went at it. So I mean, really not that difficult to copy, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So that, that almost is like a fear for me. I don't really know if I really like the quote. It's almost easier to accidentally plagiarize when you're doing music than it is art or poetry. Mm -hmm. Because say you're listening to music all day and they're like, oh, I'm going to go home and write a song. You're going to have some music or something left in your head. For example, Blurred Lines, let's bring that back up. Pharrell and Robin Thicke have to um, pay out Marvin Gaye's um, estate because um, oh, man. They, yeah. they got proved that um, they played dry some of his music. I, w I took a music course uh, last year called Issues in Popular Music. And we watched a documentary on sampling and whether sampling is plagiarism or not. Because they take the snippet of the music and they'll change it and they'll put it in the song. Does that make I it mean, any better? I mean, as time goes on, eventually you're going to get so many songs that eventually every song is going to be sort of plagiarizing some yeah. other song. Especially with the internet and all that stuff yeah. like nowadays. Like, oh, geez. As a poet, I go out of my way to make sure I'm not plagiarizing. So if I write a bomb-ass line, I put it into Google with the quotes and I see if anyone's ever used it before. And if someone's used it in like a different context, maybe it's okay. But like most of the time, I hope that I'm thinking of a thought or I'm expressing a thought in a way that hasn't been expressed ever before. And if I have, that gives me a sort of sense of validation. Totally agree. But that, that fear of being plagiarized is something that I think has haunted me ever since I started being creative. I think in, in many ways, it's something I feel like I don't hold anymore. I, I kind of dropped that fear. Because when I was a kid, I thought I had this genius idea. Basically, it was, a, it was a game. And I was so nervous about sharing it with anybody because I thought they were going to take it from yeah. me. And I realized, you know, a couple years later, the people who I had showed the game to helped me develop the game. They helped me get the news of the game out and they became some of my, some close allies while working on the game. Now, was, is it possible that one of them would steal the idea, take it and run? Well, sure, but they're not coming from the same place of inspiration as I am. So even if they did try to copy the game, they wouldn't be able to do it as well. Of course, there's examples of, you know, you don't want to be the Tesla and the Edison. You don't want to be the, it, you, you know, there's like a game exactly like Candy Crush and they just stole that game exactly. It's definitely a fear I, I had. You told me once when we were hanging out, you're like, oh, I don't really have any artistic influences. You like to keep your own style. Yeah, it's tough to say that I don't really have any influences. You can really be influenced by a lot of things. I could easily say that I'm influenced by people like B.B. King and like Muddy Waters and stuff like that. And then I could go as far as saying that I'm really influenced by Van Gogh as well and very influenced by um, Monet. But then when it comes to how I approach art and what I want to see visually and what I want people to feel or what I want them to think about when they're looking at the art, uh, I really want it to be almost subconscious 
I really want it to be really uninspired. Like literally every second that I'm painting, it's just purely accidental. And then I look back at it and I go, okay, cool. Like I got the emotions out properly. So that's what I mean is it's not uninspired, but it is at the same time. That's interesting because many people have the idea of uninspired art not being very good. It's like, oh, that's just so uninspired, but really it's more of a... The whole idea of being inspired by other artists. I, as a writer, I write more than I read. And the reason I do that is because the more I read, the more my writing becomes of what I was reading. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to, if someone tells me like, oh man, you're the next Kurt Vonnegut. I'm like, fuck, I don't want to be the next yeah. Kurt Vonnegut. I don't want to be the next anything. I want to be myself. So the idea behind that, I, I, I guess, is uh, people say that as a good writer, you should be a voracious reader. I disagree. I actually think people shouldn't study English if they want to go into writing. And the reason I think that is because I read the writing of English students, English majors, English PhDs, and their writing is a lot like 18th century, 17th century writers, poets. And it's just bad. It's just it's just awful because, well, I mean, I'm speaking out of my personal <laughs> preference here, but they're just so similar to these people who have already said the things that they're saying that I just don't see the point of it. And of course, art is subjective. And if you want to make a, a, an ode to all these 17th century uh, poets, if you want to talk about John Keats, sure. But just to me, like, well, first of all, commercially as an artist, you have to be unique to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't seem like a good plan just commercially, but also like personally, I don't know. That doesn't strike a chord with me. So I try to write more than I read, basically. Why do you say that the 17th and 18th century uh, writers write the way that they do? Do you think that they're trying to like imitate that feel because they think it might work best for this time? I think they have spent the last six to eight years of their life studying. And when you do that, you immerse yourself in their work, you take it apart. But once you do that for so long, your, your idea of what art is becomes defined by what you've been studying for the last eight years. And you can sort of add on to that baseline that the older poets have created for you. I find personally that that's sort of limiting because you're looking at a very specific niche and more specifically academic poetry. And I don't think art is supposed to be academic. I think art's just... Oh, it's a universal language. Yeah, art's communication. If I look at something and, I, and it speaks to that core humanity, I'm like, hmm. That's some good art. That's tasty. Uh, what I do when, we, when you were talking about influences was I want to limit my influences when it comes to like something visually. If I see a painting, eventually I'm going to look at how the painting was done and I'm going to go, okay, uh, I think I know how Van Gogh did this. I think I know how Monet did this. I think I know how this guy did this. And then I'll practice it and I'll make like a ton of mistakes. But then within those mistakes, I'm grabbing basically what was inspired by other artists. I'll kind of screw it up a bit accidentally. And that's where I like playing with the subconscious habit that I have. I think mistakes are very important in art. Oh, yeah. Like in any process, sometimes something not intended couldn't make the piece. Oh, exactly. That's what I aim for is to make those mistakes. Like I want to make those mistakes like over almost everything. I almost try to like gear my subconscious habit into making those mistakes so that I can continuously change my style over the time. I mean, I have a painting on the desk there that I did when I was like probably two months into painting and now I'm almost a year into it and the style is completely different. Instead of like you said, in my mind, I think that everyone should kind of read, but then when it comes to me doing stuff about art, I'll watch a documentary. And what I'll do is as I'm painting, I'll listen to this artist's story and how people are describing the artist and I'll do my own art at the same time. And I'll watch like two or three documentaries a day when I'm painting sometimes. I don't really care. I want to ask Logan and you, Greg, a question. Do you think being a perfectionist or just trying to get that perfect painting and you like keep toiling over, it, you're writing like a poem and you keep going over the same line, like, I want this to be better, I want this to be perfect. Do you think that ruins the art a bit, makes it less genuine? As an artist, I hate perfectionism, um, mainly because I'm a perfectionist. And I think a lot of <laughs> artists are perfectionists and it's pointless. What it does is it hampers your workflow and makes you spend more time than is necessary on the last 10% of what is good about the art. Just by sitting down and working on it for you know a, a regular period of time, you've done 90% of what's good about the art and what people will appreciate about the art. That last 10%, people might not notice, people not, might not appreciate. The work you put into it afterwards might make it perfect for you, but make it might make it worse for others. Yeah. So I, as a poet, uh, I'm a perfectionist and I, I wish that I wasn't because it's very, it's, it's kind of, it's harmful to me as a poet. It's, it's self-destructive. Mm -hmm. That's fair. When it comes to perfectionism, I think it should be, uh, you should be a perfectionist in how you maintain yourself. I think that you should do your absolute best to be the best that you can be as a person and uh, with your health, with uh, how you eat, 
your social life. I think you can succeed and all that. I think you can become a millionaire and still have a loving family. I think you can become a sports star and still have like, you know, you know how some like football players, they come out of the NFL and their spine is like basically in like mm-hmm. a W. You know, I don't think that is something that needs to happen. But I think that when it comes to being a perfectionist, I needed to take care of myself first in order to expand. But then when it comes to work, like this is your play, like this is your fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Why even think of it as trimming the fat, you know? I don't look over the art after I'm done going, okay, what could be better unless I'm doing a commission? And that's why I dislike mm-hmm. commissions. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of a quote. I can't remember it exactly, but it's basically an artist should be disciplined and rigid in his schedule so as to be uh, bold and experimental with his art. Yeah, you got to take care of your golden eggs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. Um, I, I like that a lot. I think that's an important distinction to make. When I'm making art, that's one thing. But the rest of my life, I have to be disciplined in it. And even the process of scheduling time to create art, that can be something you discipline in. And I think perfectionism around that sort of thing is probably okay. Yeah. Uh, it's just when it comes to the art itself where I get the problem. Yeah. I feel like the discipline is also important for your practice as I'm a drummer. And in mental health. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. course, of course. Oh yeah. But <laughs> if I want to be a better drummer, I want to take out time, not to just create and make new beats or like have like a new rhythm that I want to add to a song. I want to get better. I want to learn mm-hmm. how to do different techniques, different play a jazz technique or jazz style. I want to. I got to discipline myself to learn that style. So I feel like there's a there's definitely room to try to perfect a style. Maybe yeah. if you want to. I feel like that's more for music though, like because you can't pick up slide guitar if you never played guitar before. You got to learn guitar first, then you got to learn how to use a slide, and then you got to. If you wanted to pick up the slide guitar and just you know, play like some really old blues, like just some like All My Love by friggin' Otis Rush type blues, then like, okay, you're gonna, you, you might have some problems there. Yeah. <laughs> like, But when I picked up playing bass, uh, it was New Year's, I got a bass, it was $40. It was like a Memphis Yamaha bass and it was really short too. Like it wasn't even the size of a bass, it looked more like a guitar. But then I went in my basement and for literally 12 hours, it was just from the morning that I got the guitar till I went to sleep, I was just playing the notes up and down the neck to get the dexterity in. And then eventually I wrote my first bass line. And uh, that's how I started playing music. And that's how I really, really started to do a lot of things in my life was to start as small as possible and as uh, technique oriented as possible and then go into like learning other people's styles. Because like jazz is so free flowing, it's so nuts. If you look at like what was influencing jazz at the time, a lot of uh, I think it was what was it like heroin and like amphetamines or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Like the yeah. music was really like just well, wild. So with jazz, even though it is free flowing, it's also very technical. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a technical. What's the word I'm looking for? Like improv. Technical improv. Huh? You have to have like the techniques down to be able to improv. My knowledge of jazz comes from La La Land, where uh, <laughs> they go into a jazz club and uh, one guy's explaining how jazz is so cool, and he's like, you know, jazz, it's different every time you hear it. And then there's like, and then it's like, this guy's fighting with this guy. The drummer's trying to beat out the the trumpet guy, but the trumpet guy. Yeah. Anyway, that's the, that's my knowledge of that's my knowledge of jazz. <laughs> I'm looking at a painting. Yeah. There's a barn uh, in the background. Yeah. And there is a man with a house for a face, and he's walking away from the barn. He's got one of the, he's got his left leg just 90 degrees to his right leg, which is on the ground. When you when you say you do your art as sort of like you write it and then you look back on it, what do you think you were thinking when you were looking back on it introspectively? Okay, so um, I grew up on a 50 acre uh, like lot. Basically, there was just trees everywhere. We had a bee farm. Eventually, when I was a teenager. Major, my parents got some partridges and some chickens. Uh, we never had a full-scale barn, but what that represents is country. I did live out in the country. Uh, what those lines that you see going towards the person that you were describing, uh, those are like memories. Uh, they're faded out right now because the mental health issues that I've had has made it very difficult to remember a lot of my childhood. Um, when it comes to the person doing what they're doing, it's a prance. It's, uh, it's not a person that's trying to walk in a stiff way. They're just doing it. They're looking like they have fun and, and they are having fun, uh, but that's the heart in it. Is that that's, that's the person doing life and uh, almost uh, leaving the home life in his own way. So his position is his heart, but he, ke- he keeps his house in his head. So that's all the lessons that he learned as a child. That's all of the childhood like you know, you got to do things like this. My dad has this very funny, funny f- fudging catchphrase, which is it's not my rule, it's nature's rule. 
And that's what the house means is that I'm not going to lose that way of thinking, but I'm going to expand on it and I'm going to build something different because I've got a different heart. Cool. I think I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. That's awesome. Art about something is my favorite. I mean, like, I really can't get behind art that's not about something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Um, I want to get into the mental health. Yeah, okay. Um, (laughs) When you were diagnosed, did that change how you painted or did that conceptualize, did that frame how your paintings were before? How did that affect you as an artist? Okay, so as I said, uh, I've been doing art for a really long time as a kid. Um, One of the things that they were talking about in my diagnosis was because of the family history, they were talking about it was a possibility that I'd been bipolar since I was a kid. Uh, Sometimes bipolar disorder is seen as ADHD. So there was that. What it did for me was it basically just kind of said like, everything that you've been doing here, you're just doing like what is most common for you. Like this is your, this is okay. Like I know right now you feel really bad, but that's because you're not maintaining yourself. And that's what being diagnosed did for my art was it was saying, dude, like you're literally alive right now. Like stop staring at the wall. Like just go and eat something, go brush your teeth, go shower, go do something, go meet some people, talk to a stranger, fucking anything, like take some classes. Uh, Don't be afraid of that type of thing. Uh, I was uh, admitted to the hospital a year before I was diagnosed. Uh, They didn't diagnose me at that point, but at around that time, I was in school at a Georgian college in Aurelia, and those are some of my best friends. Like, I have notes in my pocket that they wrote me, and that's where I started painting in black. And uh, then I stopped painting for a really long time. And it was literally because my buddy Troy is just like, hey, dude, I got a paintbrush, and I've got uh, this black paint. Can you paint me this thing? I want to hang a poster on my wall because I love your doodles. And I was like, okay, cool. So I did that. And um, at that point, I didn't really realize what I was doing, but I was expressing stuff that was within me. And that's what was so interesting is as soon as, uh, as soon as that happened and as soon as my friends started to support me, I started drawing on T-shirts. And that's why I have a T-shirt brand right now is I have all these pictures from like three years ago of my buddies at parties wearing shirts that I was handing out to people that were just drawings. Fast forward, I get diagnosed and they're like, yeah, dude, like, you know, no one's trying to kill you right now, but you're bipolar, uh, you're going to get a lot of this and you can maintain it though. And you can actually see when it's about to happen. So that's when it was just like, okay, now I have to really face the hard reality in that some people believe it's like a sink or swim type world. And in a way you could describe mental illness as something that's always going to be a leak in your boat. I don't believe it as that anymore. I honestly wouldn't trade being bipolar for anything. That's basically it. Like art is something that is directly expressed from my life. And as soon as someone told me that I was bipolar, I was willing to acknowledge that creative aspect of how my brain worked. And uh, I was able to put it into words anytime I was having a problem. Like uh, something as easy as being jealous in a relationship. When you're jealous, you're not jealous of what the person's doing. Your girlfriend could be at a club right now dancing with another guy. And if you feel like that guy is better than you and that she's going to get along better with him, then you also have to look into what kind of problem that is within you. Do you feel inadequate because of that guy? Do you feel like you don't want to lose that person? Like, what is it? So those are the types of questions that I'd ask. You can go online and find them. I, if you're bipolar, I strongly suggest that you only look at scholarly articles. There's a lot of articles online that can mislead you into some really, really dark ways of thinking about yourself. Um, and then uh, really watch who you hang out with and uh, don't smoke weed. Interesting. But, yeah. Interesting. Wow. You were kind of big in a punk scene for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to know, this is like an artist thing in general, because I'm straight edge myself. Mm. Um, but do you think narcotics or like alcohol or anything like that, do you think some artists, they tend to be like, oh, well, I need it for my art. Do you think that's something that is a person to person thing? Or do you think some people are just dependent on it in general and they just try to use it as an excuse? Uh, so there is this uh, jazz trumpet player he was on heroin and when he first got big, he believed that his heroin helped him maintain his creativity in a way that helped him stay big and famous. And then he realized that he was only dependent on heroin. So when you're doing heroin, you're uh, kind of forcing your body to react in a certain way. And he believed once he finished and he quit heroin and he got clean, he was like, I've never been this good until I quit. And it's because you're deliberately building a wall to something that's like to water that's building up. And eventually you're either going to run out of drugs or that wall is going to come tumbling down because it's just drugs. Jesus Christ. 
Like, and I strongly believe that if you do drugs, you will be influenced by it. And a lot of your music, a lot of the way that you talk, a lot of your actions in person will be basically decided by that substance. But at the same time, you're probably going to be better off without it because you got to maintain yourself first. Some people say that they can do cocaine every weekend and uh, they only do it a bit, but then they find themselves doing cocaine on the weekend and then midweek and so on and so forth. It's the same thing with jogging. If you go jogging every weekend, eventually you're going to want to go jogging on like a Wednesday or Thursday. I strongly believe that a lot of people think that drugs make your music better, but uh, they probably don't. And Lee's Avenue wasn't in that thought process. Lee's Avenue wanted to comment on it. Okay, that's good. Mm. Yeah. I don't want to say I'm against drugs, but I kind of, I kind Kids, of am. Like, I don't do don't do drugs. drugs. Yeah. But like, I have no real issue. I, I, if they want to be like recreational marijuana users, I don't dislike it. It's not my personal choice. Like, I would never do it. Really, like, it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. But I know people who are like, man, I got to have a hit before I do this, or I got to do this before I do this. Like, oh yeah, I have plenty of friends like that. People are very good at justifying the things that destroy them. They oh, can, for sure. They could talk. The thing is, think about how easy it is to justify something. I could be like, um, I'm always going to wear these dress shoes. It doesn't matter what. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm always going to wear these dress shoes. If anyone argues with me, I can argue till the day like goes by. I could be like, these are the only shoes that fit my feet. Uh, I can't afford insoles because if I don't wear these shoes, then I don't. I can't work at the amazing place that I work at. Like you can make up excuse after excuse mm. after excuse, and then the more angry that you get, the more uh, you project, and the more that you almost refuse anything that anyone's telling you. So it's so easily, uh, so easy to be disillusioned by your own like want to like tell people that they don't know you properly. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. I've, I've been going through a thing. I've been trying to figure out this philosophical problem, I suppose. Basically, I think that what we're talking about when it comes to addiction can be applied to mental health. Mm. As someone who goes through depressive episodes and someone who uses poetry to communicate with also other people who feel like they're going through depressive episodes yeah. and who uses my poetry to try to bring those people out. Sometimes poets, I'm speaking from my own personal experience, can create these communities of people who share their feelings with depression and that's helpful in the moment. But what also happens is people identify with their depression and make that a part of their identity so that when that depression is challenged mm -hmm. and somebody wants to help them break out of that depression, they feel like their own identity is being attacked. Yeah. So they start to identify with the depression. They say, oh, my best art is created while I'm depressed. So I need that depression. I need to feel miserable as an artist in order to create good art. And it's, it reminds me of the, like, the heroine. Like, I need the heroine in order to you know, be big and make good art. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we're justifying the thing that's killing us. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily think that's wrong. I just, I can't, I don't know. As someone who goes through depressive episodes, I like being depressed sometimes because when I come out of it, I'm like, I have all these interesting thoughts and I feel like each depression teaches the lessons, like something like that. Yeah. But I don't know, like, is it good to identify with mental illness or should it be something that's rejected? You said that you wouldn't trade bipolar yeah. for anything. Yeah, I wouldn't trade being bipolar for anything, um, mostly because uh, I, <laughs> sounds messed up, but I like the up and down, okay, like I really do. Uh, in, uh, in a way, whenever I have a bad, bad moment, I start to realize um, how I uh, use, like how my psychology is broken down and how other people's psychology is broken down. Like saying I wouldn't trade anything for bipolar disorder is kind of wrong because everyone kind of does have their ups and downs in life. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've never really wanted to take care of myself more than when I got diagnosed. So in a way, I'm kind of clinging on to it. I do believe that I am kind of doing what you're doing with uh, what you said uh, people do with like depression, where, you know, my best art will come out of uh, like a, a manic or a depressive episode. Uh, I'm still in that belief. But the reason why I'm in that belief, and uh, this is uh, this is accepted, like this is a real theory, is that I'm not out of the habit of accepting it as it. I'm not out of that subconscious habit of believing that my bipolar disorder is something that defines me. Whenever someone, whenever I would go to a job or something like that, I would say, yeah, I have bipolar disorder because I was just scared that someone would judge me by my actions, but uh, I'm responsible for my actions. And so that's why I say that is I wouldn't trade my bipolar disorder for the world. It's just 
I'm in the habit of thinking that it's a positive thing in my life. But what's positive in my life when I have bipolar disorder is how I react to it. So instead of being very reactive to my uh, my mental illness, I'm being more proactive. I, I've always had this kind of opinion, but I think it's important. Like I'm not a very emotional person myself, but there's times where you want to have a feeling. If you're angry, you should probably, like if there's a reason why you're angry, you should probably let out that anger, but you can't just keep it all bottled inside. If you're sad, you got to get your emotions out in some way, whether yeah. that's through your art, because you, like you said, yeah. art is expressing yourself, which is very, it's an expression, mm -hmm. which I think is great. So I think art is very important for people who do have mental health issues. It's a good way to express themselves and get out their feelings in a healthy way. And connect with others. Exactly. Thank yeah, you. The connecting with others is huge. Uh, a lot of times when I was sad, a, a lot of people would say, look, like a lot of people are going through what you're going through. You know, you're not alone. And at first I was like, I'm alone because I have bipolar disorder and this is just how I am. Like, you need to back the fuck off because you don't know what it's like. Like, because like... Uh, in a way, some people will be like, you know, I'm just so sad that I'll stay in bed all day and I'll harp over like a really bad like feeling. And I go, yeah, but you, what I do is when I'm in your position, I go to a point where not only do I start to think about the sad thing that's making me sad over and over again, but I'll create a plethora of other ideas around how it's making me, uh, how something else could happen. Like something as easy as someone walked by in the hallway would turn into their steps are something that they're using to communicate with me because these people are trying to come after me. And I'm also sad. It would just kind of build off like that. So I'm like, how do I express that to people? I would feel like, oh man, like no one's been through what I've been through. Like, oh, I'm just a unique person, blah, blah, blah. And I get this huge pent up anger. Like I'm technically an angry person. I actually am. But uh, I do stuff and I'm proactive in it so that I don't project that anger onto other people. And then the more and more that I do that, the less and less that the, those problems become a thing. And then the more and more I'm able to empathize with people and realize that, yeah, you know, a lot of people do have problems that the way their, their problems impact them uh, impacts them almost on the same degree and level that my problems impact me. So that's where I can, you know, say, I feel like this and this is what I'm perceiving and you feel like this and that's what you're perceiving, but we're still feeling the same thing. And that's what art taught me the most. Like, on my Instagram, and I know you guys said you can post it, so if anyone listening wants to actually go see it, I have a painting called uh, The Great Brixton, and it's called Our Calm Storm. It's done after a garden in England, and on the right side of it is a very stormy-looking area that's coming towards the left of this house. And the sentence that I use to express what this painting means, and this is the painting that I painted when I first started seeing Tasha and dating her. Uh, Tasha's my girlfriend, by the way. I love her a lot. The color of the house, uh, it's very vibrant. And that's where it says fortified with passion, the vibrant colored house won't lose its color in life's storm. So whenever life comes at you and wants to screw with you, that colorful house isn't gonna just lose all of its oranges and reds, it's just gonna get wet. And uh, yeah, you know, some storms are really bad and they damage houses, but you can always rebuild. You can always paint them back over again. So that's the thing about great relationships, but uh, I can say as much as I want that, that it's about Tasha and I's relationship uh, because, you know, we're people, but it's mostly about my relationship with how proactive I am. You know, if I deal with the storm properly, then uh, I will keep my vibrancy in a way. <laughs> that's really beautiful, man. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. That's well, that's really the thing sweet. about art. What's great about it is that you can express your ways in ways that words can never do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's better than just like saying, Oh, I love you. Like you can just be like, "Hey, I painted this for you because I really want to express this feeling to you." Or I wrote this song for you. Or, I wrote this poem for you. Or you can also, I mean, the way I use writing, especially journaling, I find journaling every day is really important for me. Yeah. Uh, I use it as communication with myself. So I can't, I don't necessarily know exactly what I'm feeling at all times. But if I create a picture of myself by journaling every day, I get those snapshots. And if I feel like I'm getting low in a depressive episode, I can look back to how I felt when I wasn't in a depressive episode. And I can almost give me words of encouragement from the past, which I'm putting down in this journal and then I can refer to later. And that's my coping mechanism, more of an introverted coping mechanism, surely. But I'm sort of reaching out to myself and being like, hey, man, how you doing? Like, because I know I'm going to fall again. And when I do, I just want to, it feels like I'm not going to be okay. But then I have something that lets me know that I am going to be okay. I've done this like a hundred times before and I can get brought back up. Journaling is like that for me. Performance is basically trying to do that to other people. Um, or at least the attempt to do that. Yeah. 
that was a good way to end it, the, the whole talking about that painting. Logan, it's been fantastic. It has been. Well, yeah, it was fantastic. You know, thanks for having me so much. This is such a cool opportunity. I've never been part of something like this, so I'm glad to be able to share. Uh, yeah. oh, thank you so much for uh, listening to the podcast. If you listen to the full thing. If you listen to the full <laughs> thing. If you only skip to the end, uh, that's good too. <laughs> All right, well, bye. Bye. <laughs>